Hi, and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision session with me, Christine. So today's lesson, I'm going to look at recycling within the ecosystems. So to start off with, we'll look at the carbon cycle. So we need to think about carbon dioxide and the fact that carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Now, we know, because we've already studied module five, photosynthesis, that fixation of that carbon dioxide occurs in the light independent reaction. So when plants photosynthesize, what they do is they take that carbon dioxide, they fix that, and they fix it to the RUBP to make the GP. The GP then gets converted into TP and that TP can then go off and be converted into all the different plant carbon compounds that there are. So it depends whether it's cellulose, whether it's glucose, whether it's sucrose, whether it's starch, whether it's amino acids and proteins. Regardless of what that carbon compound is, that carbon dioxide has now been fixed. Well, what we know is that plants also need to do respiration. So if they need to respire, what they're going to do through decarboxylation, both in the aerobic respiration process and anaerobic respiration, they are going to release carbon dioxide back out. So therefore that carbon dioxide goes back to the atmosphere. So what we have right now, just looking at this solely, is this cycling that the carbon has been cycled. The carbon dioxide was taken in and fixed it was then utilized as a respiratory substrate and then it was then released back into the atmosphere. Well, if we have our plants, which are our producers, and we have a consumer, i.e. our cow, and that is going to feed, consume on the plant material, what's going to happen is those carbon compounds are going to be broken down and then they're going to be assimilated into the animal carbon compounds. Through that process of feeding, the animal is going to digest and then assimilate into their carbon compounds. Now, the key thing to remember is that animals will also do respiration. Therefore, they will be taking the carbon compounds from the plant carbon compounds, taking it, making their own carbon compounds, and also releasing carbon compounds out into the atmosphere. Again, this is a cycle. Then what we have is that the cows will obviously be needing to excrete any of the material, which is waste material. So in the case of feces and urine, they are going to contain our animal carbon compounds. And those animal carbon compounds are going to be decomposed by decomposers. So microorganisms are going to release enzymes which are going to digest the materials in the feces, in the urine, and they are going to then utilize and use them with their own processes, and they themselves are going to do respiration. So therefore, they are going to release that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So it's important to note that if we have any animal material or any plant material which has not been decomposed, i.e. there's been some form of prevention of that, there it's too cold, there's not enough oxygen present, it has been covered with sediment, whatever that may be. If this is left for millions of years, then what you have are fossil fuels starting to be formed. And those fossil fuels can then be combusted, they can then be used as a fuel source, and that will again release carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. So this is a way in which we are recycling those nutrients within the ecosystem through the use of the carbon cycle. So that's looking at carbon containing compounds. Now, what you should note is when we are looking at moving anything through the ecosystem, we have to think about the fact that our energy transformations are never 100% efficient. The sunlight energy is absorbed by the producers through the process of photosynthesis. What they do is they will then produce those compounds which are then available to the next level up. Now, when it comes to the producer being fed on by the consumer, the primary consumer, they are going to be feeding, but both of them were respiring. So therefore they were losing the thermal energy 
through the process of respiration. So therefore cellular respiration loses that energy because that energy is transferred. It was light energy which was converted into chemical energy which is then released as thermal energy. And obviously any of the producers or the primary consumers which were lost as in leaf uh, dropping or with feces, loss of tissue, any of that urine, that again is going to be decomposed by our bacteria and fungi. They will therefore respire, releasing thermal energy out. So energy transformations are never 100% efficient. And then if we look at the primary consumer, moving on to the secondary consumer, again, same process. When they are feeding, do they eat all of the different material? Well, if you're eating the producer, are you going to be eating the bark? Are you going to be eating the um, rough lignified vessels? No, you are not. So therefore, there are parts of the plant that are not actually going to be utilized by the primary consumer. The primary consumer being fed on by the secondary consumer, are they going to be eating the bones? No, they're not. So therefore, what's really important is that we note that that energy transformation is never 100% efficient, but you should know the levels as you go up through a food chain. So you have your primary producer, you have your primary consumer, your secondary consumer, and your tertiary consumer. And every time as we go up, we get less and less energy available to the next trophic level. And because of that, it means that we can't just have one food chain, we actually have to eat from lots of different sources. And that becomes a food web. So in my example here, if I have one million joules of sunlight energy, how much energy is available in that primary producer? Well, there's only 10,000 joules of energy available for the primary producer to be passed through to the primary consumer. Well, remember that primary consumer feeding on that primary producer will not get all of that energy. And therefore, the energy that is stored in the primary consumer is only 1000 joules of energy. And again, as we move up to the secondary consumer, we're only getting 100 joules of energy. And as we move up to the tertiary consumer, we only end up with about 10 joules of energy. So it's very small and we never tend to get past that tertiary consumer. On some occasions, we can get to a quaternary consumer, but never up to a fifth level. So the key thing to remember is that that respiratory energy loss, organic compounds are oxidized to release energy, which is then used to drive other metabolic processes. Well, respiration is all about making, for example, the ATP molecules for active transport the ATP molecules so that we can move substances against the concentration gradient. ATP molecules are needed for muscle contraction. So there's so many other things that need to drive that processes. So that release of energy, that heat energy going out to the environment is because of those metabolic reactions occurring. And when we talk about plants, they also need to do active transport. If we we're looking at translocation, for example, we need to actively load the sucrose into the flow. So remember, there's always going to be linking topics together. Now, when we look at a plant and we look at the gross primary production, we call that the GPP. That is the total energy which is going to be fixed by photosynthesis and that is only about 0.5 to 1 percent that's it and we always need to make sure we know our measurements in our unit so it's a kilojoules per meter squared per year so our gpp is our gross primary production our net primary production the total energy which is going to be fixed as biomass the mass removing any water, so total dry organic matter that is going to be available for heterotrophs, those primary consumers to feed on it, that is known as your NPP, the net primary production. So how do we get from our GPP to our NPP? We need to work this out as an efficiency, so our biomass transferred 
divided by our biomass intake times 100. So how do we work this out? If they're gonna ask you about a question, they'll be looking for you to understand because you need to work out your biomass, you need your dry organic matter. You need to dry that specimen in an oven at about 80 degrees C. You then will measure the dry mass using a balance. You then use a calorimeter, important, calorimeter, not a colorimeter. The calorimeter is going to estimate the chemical energy which was stored in that biomass. So when you are using that calorimeter, you are going to be releasing that energy as thermal energy and that will heat up water and you will be measuring the temperature changes that will occur. Now, if we're looking at the land measurement and we're looking at measuring that biomass, we talk about it being the grams per square meter if we're using our units for land. If we're looking at water, we need to look at it as being the grams per cubic meter. So they have in the past asked this question looking for you to state the units that you would use. So you need to think about on land, we're talking about area, whereas when we're talking about the water, we're talking about the volume. So land area is always squared, whereas if we're talking about volume, we should be talking about it cubed. So now we get on to the last part of this moving substances through the ecosystem. So here we have the nitrogen cycle. So we know that nitrogen N2 is in the atmosphere. We know that we have organisms which can fix nitrogen, just like the plants are going to fix carbon in the process of the light independent reaction, other organisms can actually fix nitrogen and they are called nitrogen fixing bacteria. So when we look at nitrogen fixation, we're talking about ammonia being produced. So the nitrogen is being fixed with hydrogens to produce ammonia. This happens in the root nodules of nitrogen fixing bacteria, which are found inside those root nodules and those nitrogen fixing bacteria are called rhizobium and how I remember that is my roots are rhizobium are the bacteria which are found in those root nodules. So the rhizobium bacteria in the root nodules are going to fix the nitrogen to make ammonia. What we also have is in the soil, we have other nitrogen fixing bacteria and those nitrogen fixing bacteria are called azotobacter. So azotobacter are found in the soil and they do the exact same thing. They take the nitrogen and they fix that with hydrogens to form ammonia. Now, what then happens is the plants will then use the ammonia and they will then be able to absorb it and convert it into amino acids which can then be joined together to form proteins. So the plants as they grow are growing because they have the proteins, those proteins that came from the amino acids, the amino acids were actually being produced from the ammonia that was being made through these nitrogen fixing bacteria. So what we have then is our plants now have these nitrogen containing molecules inside them. Well, our consumers, our primary consumers are going to feed on the polypeptides, the proteins inside the plants. And what they're going to do is they are going to break them down, digest them to amino acids, and then assimilate them into their own proteins. So therefore we are cycling the nitrogen through the ecosystem. The nitrogen was fixed by the bacteria. That nitrogen containing molecule was then used to produce am amino acids. The amino acids were then used to produce the proteins. The proteins were then digested by the consumer after they had fed on the producer and then they were assimilated into their own proteins. Now, obviously, like we said before with the carbon cycle, we have decomposers. Well, we also have that with the nitrogen cycle. Ammonification is where the decomposers like bacteria and fungi 
are going to take dead material, the dead leaves, the feces, the urine that has come from the consumer or the plant, and they are going to convert that into ammonium ions. And those ammonium ions can then be oxidized through the process of nitrification by different types of bacteria. So what you have is the ammonia ions are going to be converted into nitrite by nitrosomonas bacteria. That is an oxidation reaction. We are nitrifying the ammonium ions into nitrites. Then we need to do another oxidation reaction. So we need a different bacteria here. The nitrite is then converted into nitrates through another oxidation reaction and that is with the nitrobacter bacteria. Now once we have it as nitrates, those nitrate ions will then be absorbed by the plants and when they're absorbed by the plants they can then be converted into amino acids and then they can be converted into the polypeptides and the proteins. So therefore what we have is this cycling of the nitrogen going from one nitrogen containing molecule to another and it being moved through the ecosystem through the different organisms which are found within that ecosystem. Now if there is no oxygen present or a absence of oxygen, for example, in peat bogs where they are very waterlogged and there are low levels of oxygen, what can happen is nitrate ions can actually be denitrified, denitrification occurs, the nitrogen can be removed by denitrifying bacteria. And therefore what we've done is we've taken the nitrate ions in the soil and remove the nitrogen to go back into the atmosphere. Again, it is a cycle that's going around. So it's important for you to note that the ecosystem's recycling of its nutrients is really important to maintain the diversity within the ecosystem. So I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you haven't already done so, please do check out my revision platform www.aiqchat.com